welcome to Crooks Memorial United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Lisa Barbary, and I have the joy to be the pastor here, and we are so glad that you could join us for worship. We hope you'll make your presence known through the comment boxes in Facebook or YouTube, or by filling out the Connect card that you find a link for online, or by visiting our church website at crooksmemorialumc.org. But we also invite you to hit the share button. Let others know that you are worshiping today. And this is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. And I pray that you'll take a few moments now with the help of a video to center yourselves and prepare your hearts to worship God together. Friends, as pilgrims, we are invited to take this journey in the season of Lent towards the one who calls each of us by name. As disciples, we follow Jesus wherever he leads, pulling our fears and, and doubts and longings behind us. And as believers, we trust in the God who so often surprises us, whose promises took on flesh and blood in the good news named Jesus. And today, as we continue that journey, we encounter Abraham and the covenant that God makes with him. We recall, perhaps through our visuals today, the story of God telling Abraham that he can look up to the skies and count the stars and he'll be able to count his offspring in the same way. This promise to make of Abraham and Sarah a multitude of nations. Friends, let us sing, joining our voices together in God, whose love is reigning o'er us.
I invite you now into a time of prayer, an opportunity to pray for ourselves, for others, for our community and world. It's a chance for you, if you want to name any joys or concerns, to do so via our comment boxes in the midst of our gathered community. As you hear me say the words, Lord, hear our prayer, I invite you to respond with the words, in your love, answer. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the example of Abraham and for all the saints who have gone before us, for those who waited in patience for your promises to come to pass, for those who lived in hope while around them it seemed to be only darkness, for those who witnessed to you when it was not considered the proper thing to do, for those who forgot their own selves and their desire to obey your commands and respond to your call upon their lives. Help us today, O oh God, to examine the level of our faith, to look seriously at our resistance, to talk about the cross and about sacrifice, and to consider in prayer our reluctance to give up the things of this world, to risk our reputation, our comfort, and our security for the sake of following you, for the sake of witnessing to you, for the sake of obeying you. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would make us bold in our faith. By our self-forgetting, our, our self-denial, help us make visible to all our brothers and sisters the reality of your power and care, the power and care that is so often made evident when we confess our weakness and so often concealed from others when we are strong. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love answer. We pray, O oh Lord, for those people whose names or faces or needs are resting upon our hearts today, for the members of our church whose health is failing as they age, for those whose families are struggling to deal with strained relationships and adult confusion and uncertainty, for those who have little or no faith and who seem to be lost even though your light shines around them and your word is close at hand. Lord, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. All these things, Lord, we pray to you and through your son, Jesus, who died that we might live and who lives that we might never die. And we share in the prayer that he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our service where we have our children's message. And so if you have any young disciples with you, it's a good time for them to come just a little closer to the screen. Hopefully some of them are using their worship bulletins today in the midst of our worship. But today, Jim Pyle has a message for all of us. Hello, boys and girls. I'm going to show you something. I wonder if you can tell what it is. Can you see that? Yeah, can you see what it is? It's a quarter. You got it. That's right. 25 cents. When I was young, my father said, Jimmy, I'm going to give you an allowance. I didn't even know what an allowance was. He said, I'm going to give you 25 cents every week. Whoa. He promised to give me 25 cents. Did he do it because I was such a good boy and did good all the time? Probably not. No, he did it because he was my parent and he loved me. And so I could have a little bit of money and a quarter. Oh, a quarter was worth a lot in those days. You know, with that quarter, I could go to the movies for 15 cents, buy a nickel soft drink and buy a nickel candy. Oh, and I was a happy boy every Saturday afternoon. Well, in today's Bible story, God gives Abraham a promise. We'll call him Abe for short. Yep. God gave him actually two promises. I'll tell you about them very quickly. The first promise, he, God told Abraham, Abe, I am going to give you a child. 
And you know what Abraham's reaction to that, since he didn't have any children? He laughed. Ha! You're going to give me a child? I don't think so, because I'm almost 100 years old, and my wife is 90 years old. But God said, yes, I'm going to give you a child, and even better than that, your descendants, all those children's children's children and so forth, they'll become mighty nations. In fact, some of them will become kings. But here's the second promise. I am going to be their God, and they are going to be my people forever and ever and ever. Wow, what a promise that was. In fact, God called that a covenant. And boy, was Moses surprised. This was quite unexpected, just like me and my allowance. Didn't look for it, didn't deserve it, but got it just the same. And you know, even today, even today, through Jesus, God's promise still holds. You know, when I got older, my father stopped giving me an allowance. No, I had to make my money myself. I had to get a job. He still loved me, but, you know, I couldn't depend on him for my money. But with God, even no matter how old we get, we can still depend on him because his promise still holds today. He is going always to be our God and we are always going to be his people for the rest of our lives and beyond. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 through 7 and verses 15 and 16. When Abrams was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations. For an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations, kings of people, shall come from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bob, thank you for sharing our scripture with us today. It's a joy to get to see you. We heard it in what Bob just read, that this is another story of covenant. Last week, we explored the story of the covenant God made with Noah and ultimately all of creation. And today it's the covenant that we hear made with Abraham. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here. In Noah's um, covenant with God, it was a bit unconditional. But today's covenant with Abraham sounds like it involves a little bit more action. Because we hear God say, I am God Almighty. That gets translated to El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless. Now, some translations even say, righteous instead of blameless. And these words actually echo Noah's story if we think about it, because in scripture, we hear that Noah was a right man, was blameless in his generation, and that Noah walked with God. Now today we hear that Abraham is to walk before God. And I think Abraham has been doing this already for some time. Now, this slight change of word between these two stories doesn't really shift things too drastically, I think. 
but it's enough that we should take note of. This walking before God, a walking ahead of, like Abraham has been doing all throughout his story without knowing for sure where God was going, where it would lead, and, and, and all the while trusting and being faithful. And friends, I think we're called to do the same as disciples, knowing that while we are walking before God, that God can still be with us, above us, below us, beside us, ahead of us, behind us. Those are words from a Celtic prayer that you usually often hear me use. So Abraham's story, let's think about his story, begins a little earlier than today's passage. It it carries through a, a bit of Genesis. So if we back up a little bit, we recall that when about 24 years prior to today's reading, Abraham, 75 years old, is first called by God. And it's a promise made to him to make a great nation from him. So this is a God, this is God, of course, but for Abraham, this is a God that he most likely didn't know. We know that Abraham is from Chaldean, and there were multiple gods that were recognized in in his culture. But through his life, he's been brought to this point and recognizing and turning himself towards God, rending his heart and listening. Abraham began to walk, not knowing where it would go. And the journey was one of sacrifice because God called him out of his homeland, out of comfort, and onto a path to a place that God said, I will show you. He didn't say, Abraham, I'm taking you here. He said, I will show you. And then he enters lands of famine and enemies surrounding him. And today, a bit of a sacrifice in being renamed. His name will be old from Abram to a new name of Abraham. And all along this journey was not smooth. 75 years at the beginning and now we're 24 years later. It was not smooth just because of where it took Abraham and Sarah. It was not smooth because of the choices that they made as well. They are far from perfect, just like all of us, but they were faithful but they were also selfish. They made decisions that hurt themselves, that hurt loved ones, that hurt one another. We know from some of these stories how Abraham at one point sells his wife, how Sarah uh, forces her slave to sleep with Abraham. It's not always good, but they pick themselves right back up and God's promises remain. They kept moving. They didn't give up. They kept walking and they kept following. And the greatest challenge though for them was this tension between the fact that Sarah was barren and God had this magnificent promise of life to make offspring more than the stars could be counted. They resorted to trying to fulfill that promise on their own. But God needed to be the one to fulfill it, to provide for it 20 Four years later, God is saying now, I make from you a multitude of nations, Abraham, and it's an everlasting covenant with you and to all, uh, as Jim wonderfully illustrated in his children's message, I will be your God and they will all be my people forever. So imagine, especially for us in a society that loves instant gratification, 24 years of waiting, of believing, of hoping, and walking step after step. Faithful. They didn't quit the journey. Now, they weren't perfect, just like we've said, but they kept turning their life to God and trusting. And so, perhaps, perhaps it was through this journey of living more fully into who God had created them to be over this time that now, now it's the time that has finally come because they're ready. So much so that God gives them new names, which really brings new purpose for them. That's what this renaming signifies, that they now have this new purpose to grow God's people, the covenant fulfilled, and then blessed Abraham with a 
another hundred years, an entire lifetime to continue to live and, and to flourish in. Perhaps it was needing to have taken that journey, learning from their experiences and what we call shedding themselves, becoming barren in a different sense than Sarah is barren. They could be ready, ready to receive this promise. Isn't that our story too? This promise is for us too. God is our God and we are God's people forever. And we also have this new covenant made through Jesus Christ. That, that covenant of, of offering of salvation offered through Christ's life and death and resurrection. Salvation is offered to us as we open up our hearts. It's, it's offered to us and worked out in our lives through grace. That is the work of grace in our lives, that as we grow in it, that salvation comes to be. But to truly, fully receive, perhaps, perhaps we must walk before God and come before God barren, empty. There's a story uh, called Stone Soup. It's told in many different cultures and languages, and the Portuguese tradition talks about a wandering monk with an empty pot who finds himself in the midst of a village. And as he moves through the village, he goes person to person and asks them for any scrap of bread or, or little leftovers from their tables. And the village people either ignore him or just send him on his way. The monk gets to the center of town and announces that that evening he will host a feast and serve the most amazing meal of stone soup. So of course the people are curious. So they all come and they gather around and the monk starts a fire and he gets out his, his empty pot and he fills it with water and he, he drops a stone in it. And after stirring and letting it simmer just a little bit, he tastes it and he says, it's good, but it's not quite ready. So of course the people ask, well, why not? And he says, well, it needs a little pepper and a pinch of salt, but I don't have any in my bag. And one of the village people says, I have pepper and salt at home, and they run home, get it, and bring it back and put it in the soup bowl. Taste it again. It's better, still not quite right. And so then he says, mm, I think it needs some onions. I have onions at home, runs home, the villager, gets onions, comes back, puts it in the pot, and the story starts to repeat itself as the monk tastes the soup and it's still not quite ready and he names another item and a different villager runs home to get that item. Carrots and slices of beef and, and garlic and potatoes, the list can go on until a pot is filled, almost running over and everyone is in anticipation for this feast. And one by one, the monk fills the bowls of soup. Everyone enjoys with laughter and fellowship eating this amazing stone soup. It's an empty pot, and it was used as an opportunity to fill people and to bring people together. I think Sarah, along with Abraham, felt an emptiness, much like maybe an empty pot represents. But as they remained faithful, continually rending their hearts to God, God filled them. So might it just be that in order to more fully claim God's promise that we too must walk before God empty, like the pot, barren, in a different sense than Sarah. I mean, when we do claim the promise that God offers to us to be our God and for us to be God's people to pursue our life with Christ, we are called to die to our former ways, to really empty ourselves to take on a new life, that we can be made new in Christ. We then allow that grace that we talked about to strip away all the things that prevented us and prevent us from living fully into who God has created us to be. And all the while space is made, we can allow God to fill that space with the things that make us righteous and blameless. We will never be perfect, 
but with Christ and grace, we are made better than we were before, and as good Methodists, we say we go on to perfection. But barren first, emptying ourselves of sin and our own agendas, our own desires, our, even our own hopes and expectations, and rather to fill those with God's dreams and God's hopes and God's expectations for us. And together, together with other disciples and, and our community, we grow as God's promised people. So I'm going to stretch a little bit here and say that the church, I think, the church as the building, the church building and the church structure and the church institution is kind of like the empty pot, barren until the people of God, the real church, fills it with the gifts that we have been given, right? So here's my stretch. Perhaps we are the meat and the potatoes and the onions and the carrots that together we become alive, that together we become flavorful and flavor all that is around us, that together we become what God needs to use in order to feed others and to nourish others. Do you ever feel like the pot, though? Empty, bare, like you have nothing to offer? Imagine Sarai, before she became Sarah, empty, bare, feeling the weight of God's promises and perhaps forgetting it was not for her to make happen or to provide, but rather to simply just offer herself as an instrument, trusting and believing that God, God would be the one to do it. God would fill her as promised. And God's promised the same for all of us if we turn to walk before God, rending our hearts and giving over our lives, even if that takes an entire lifetime. Because we never stop. We're never perfect. We always have to be turning, all so that our lives might be filled and that God's great promise will be claimed because we know that God's promise endures and that God's promise is forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want us to also think about going back to this emptying and how we are called to empty ourselves before God and, and make space for Christ and, and grace to work in our lives. And I often say one of the ways we do that is through the gift of confession. It is a gift. We might not always like to have to confess our sins to God, but we are called. <laughs> we are called indeed uh, to name the things for which we should not have done, to name things that perhaps we should have done and didn't. And so I want to invite us now into a time of emptying, a time of offering confession. You'll join me in response. Just follow along with the words on the screen and you'll, you can either pray the whole prayer or, or just simply share the words that are in bold. Let us pray. Gracious God, you reached into Abraham and Sarah's lives and asked them to dream the impossible dream, that you would transform what appears to have been a barren and lifeless situation into one overflowing with promise and hope. And through faith in you, they believed your promises. Forgive us, O oh God, if we never get beyond thinking of your call on our lives as an impossible dream or even as an unwelcome interruption. Faithful God, the Apostle Paul emphasizes Abraham's complete trust and faith in your promises and how he grew ever stronger in faith fully convinced of your ability to fulfill what had been promised. Forgive us, O oh God, when we find it hard even to hear your promises above commercial assurances of transformation, promises tempting us to trust the newest and trendiest product to realize our dreams. Merciful God, Jesus revealed the great depth of your love in his determination to defeat evil 
even when this meant giving up his own life. Forgive us, O oh God, when we allow the power of evil to flourish because we fear that taking up one's cross would be just too costly an exercise. Gracious and loving God, forgive our lack of trust in you. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Help us when we hesitate and strengthen us when we are weak. Breathe your spirit afresh into our hearts and minds, our lives, so that we have the courage to follow Jesus wherever he takes us. Amen. Friends, faith has reckoned as righteousness. We hear these words in Romans chapter 4, that faith has reckoned as righteousness to us who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death because of our sins and was raised for the sake of our righteousness. Hear and believe these words about God's amazing grace, grace experienced through Jesus' sacrificial love as forgiveness of all our sins. Thanks be to God. I invite us now into our practice of generosity. We recognize this as a spiritual discipline that enables us to grow in God's grace. And not only through the ways that we can offer financial gifts to the ministry and mission here at Crooks, uh, through the gifts that God has given to us, but really about offering our whole selves in ministry and mission for Christ. And so there's opportunities coming up for ways in which for us to have this practice, not only through our weekly giving, but we know that next Sunday, March 7th, we'll be collecting non-perishables for the York County Food Closet. So you're invited to come through the church parking lot anytime between 1 and 2.30 and drop off any goods that you have. We'll actually take those out of your car. You don't even have to get out. But we are looking for uh, just a couple more volunteers if you might feel led to help us that day. And we'll do that all socially distanced and wearing masks. We know that we continue to collect for our Easter offering that goes to support Thrive and also our local food pantry. I had the joy to be a part of uh, Thrive's annual meeting earlier this past week and to hear about all the wonderful ministry that they are doing and the ways in which they are serving and meeting needs in our community. I'll probably share more about that next week, but in our weekly e-news, there were some updates about that as well. But friends, I pray that you'll use this time to reflect on how it is you may be called to be a part of Christ's work in the world. Please join me in the prayer that you find on the screen. God of all, you love us and have claimed us. As you blessed Sarah and Abraham, you have invited us into the blessing of connection within the family of humanity, whom you continue to bless. We give our tithes and offerings in celebration of the depths of our blessing and pray that they will strengthen the church across the world to bless all your children. In the holy name of Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray in gratitude. Amen.
Friends, God's promises endure from generation to generation. May the God of Sarah and Abraham, the God who sent Jesus to redeem us, and the God whose covenant is eternal, bless you and make you fruitful. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.